right above the house. Looks like it's going to drop down on top of our house, but hopefully it won't. When you Google Gerald, what you get is the tornado. Unless you had an underground shelter, you were in trouble. Man. Nothing left. They were there last night, and there's nothing left. I mean, not a board left. It was a horrific sight. You know, the livestock was sprawled all over the place. We, we did not recover everybody in their entirety. I saw a lady with no bottom half, and there's just massive I'm destruction. Not. It's hard to talk about it. still. 25 years later, it uh, doesn't seem, you know, this doesn't seem right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome in. I'm Chris Radcliffe. And I'm Leslie Draffin. 25 years ago today, a tornado tore through Gerald, Texas, ripping apart homes and lives. That day, 27 people were taken, including entire families. The tornado was the biggest in Texas history, stretching as wide as 13 football fields and leaving behind a seven mile path of destruction. The survivor stories are heart wrenching, describing scenes most of us can never imagine going through. Tonight, we hear from those survivors and take a look back at how this storm changed Gerald forever. went outside to get the newspaper, and I had never felt early morning humidity. It was, it was remarkably moist and uncomfortably warm and moist outside at that hour. When the, when the Gerald tornado first organized, it was what's called multi-vortex, which is four rotating centers going around a central center. I saw uh, the first tornado of the day that I intercepted was in uh, central to southwestern McLennan County, southwest of Waco. Then there was the tornado at Lake Belton, Morgan's Point, Lake Belton. And there were a couple of smaller, weaker tornadoes around the lakes, around Belton Lake and Stillhouse Lake. And then I continued on down to Prairie Dell, which is in Southern Bell County, where there was uh, the next tornado. And that tornado dissipated uh, southwest, south of Prairie Dell, and within six seconds, what would become the Gerald tornado developed right on the Williamson Bell County line. The tornado that went through the west side of Gerald, where we are right now, uh, killed a lot of people by dismembering them. Literally, the bodies were in pieces. It's it's a uh, it's a when you see something like that occur, I don't think it ever goes away. It's There's bad. nothing left. They were there last night and there's nothing left. I mean, not a board left.
That day, meteorologists scrambled to let people know what was happening. The path of the tornado took an odd path south, straight down I-35. The storm moved in conjunction with a southward moving cluster of supercell thunderstorms. These storms produced 20 tornadoes, mainly along the interstate. It was a day meteorologists and storm spotters who were there still can't get out of their minds. It's in somebody's backyard. It looks like it ain't hardly moving, doesn't it? I don't think it is. I'd been watching the storms because it, uh, I was doing all radio at that time. Look at that. And I have a granddaughter that was over in Troy, Texas, and she called me and she said, Grandpa, uh, are we going to have bad weather? There's the tornado right there. It's going to cross right in here. It's heading south. It may actually come on into Temple. I told her it looks like it, and she was home alone. And I told her, if it gets real bad, you go in the closet and you stay there with your phone until Grandpa calls you. This thing was the biggest monster I had seen. When I watched it, it was just one huge circular cloud doing a real slow turn, and there were multiple funnels dropping out of the thing. And the one thing I noticed was the damage, because normally when you look at uh, any of these F2, 3, 4, mainly the 3, 4s, and 5s, you see a lot of damage. We didn't see that down there. I had never seen a storm cell or system this big visually. And, and like I say, it looked like one huge, if you, if you could picture like a, maybe a massive cake, just slowly rotating through the atmosphere and all this activity dropping out of it. And back then, didn't have the cell phones and anything to take kind of pictures of it. It was a phenomenal storm. There was not that emotion with me because uh, you got to figure at that time, not only was a weatherman, but I had already been through Vietnam and set up the combat weather teams in Vietnam. So mine was more analytical and, and with a mindset on getting people out ahead of that storm system protected. Uh, whenever I went down there and looked at it, then it kind of dawned on me the devastation. But it, to me, it was understandable because that was that was phenomenal power. Almost every window of the house is breaking, Dad. Don't worry about it, son. Hang it on your left. Dude, come here. Get it off me. May 27th, 1997, very warm and humid day in Central Texas. It's hard to talk about it still. 25 years later, it uh, doesn't seem, you know, just doesn't seem right. You know, we went on the air and, and it was 147, I think. The first tornado dropped. And uh, it, it was an open country. As I walked outside the building and I saw the tornado, and it was, if it had been moving southeastward, it would have hit the Bruceville Eddy, but it didn't. It moved southward and went close to Moody. That storm eventually would produce a tornado and went right over Lake Belton and hit the Morgan's Point Marina, destroyed the marina, picked up the whole marina, lifted it up, and dropped it out in the middle of Lake Belton. Um, there were like 105 boats, and only about half of them were salvageable. And it picked up a bunch of fish picked up a whole bunch of fish, you know, shad, and dropped them on the cars at Belton High School. And as it kept going south-southwest, it was paralleling Interstate 35. And I'm on the air by then, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, non-stop coverage, telling people, hey, this is, this is real, get your cars put up in Temple, it's got large hail. We were getting reports from Prairie Dale that this little tornado had spun up around Prairie Dale, which is north of Gerald. Little, real fine, little, little real ropey tornado. Yeah, it was just spinning really fast. And then that storm formed uh, into a multi-vortexed F5 tornado. And it's still to this day, as far as I know, the last F5 tornado in the history of Texas. But people knew it was coming. It just, they didn't have, unless you had an underground shelter, you were in trouble. At the time, they thought the winds were in excess of 260 miles an hour 
in Gerald, Texas. It, it took the pavement, it took the pavement off the roads. The worst part was the loss of life there. You know, uh, 27 lives were lost that day total. Some were whole families. At that time, it had been one of the first TV stations ever to go wall to wall for seven hours straight and have a live tornado go right by the building. But we, we all did our best that day. You know, we, I trained for almost 10 years to do that. Yeah, it changed my life. I mean, there's no, no doubt about it. I still tear up when I talk about it. It's hard. As that storm bared down over Gerald, residents had just minutes to find safety. But even the safest place they could find would be no match for the tornado that ripped out everything in its path. Yeah, first responders that day didn't even know where to start looking for people because nothing was left. We're here trying to locate people. Their homes are not here anymore. This is no typical Tuesday for Gary Griffin. It's a day he can't get out of his mind. You can't see it, but I got goosebumps right now. My, my arms are tingling pretty good because I remember it like it was yesterday. Griffin was a Williamson County constable when the Gerald tornado happened. He says he was the first first responder to arrive on scene, finding almost half of those killed. Out of the 27, four, I found 14 of them myself before other help started showing up. Those images still haunt him. One was a little baby underneath some debris, uh, the Igo family. Uh, it was a horrific sight. You know, the livestock was sprawled all over the place. The hides were ripped off of them. With downed power lines and a lack of technology, identifying those bodies were a nightmare. We, we did not recover everybody in their entirety. There were body parts sprawled all over that area. And it took us a lot of tedious work to identify them folks. 25 years later, an unfortunate event that forever changed him. You now, if there's bad weather in the middle of the night, I'm going to turn on the TV and I'm going to track radar and it, it makes me nervous. And because uh, I've seen, I've seen, I've heard that, no, I've heard that train. I wish I wouldn't have been there. But on the other hand, that's what we kind of signed up for. From the air, much of Gerald looks as if it simply disappeared. As first responders work to find bodies and survivors, those who work in media did everything that they could to gather information about what was going on. That day 25 years ago left lasting impressions on our former employees, and I had a chance to talk to some of them as they share their memories from that fateful day. Lisa Heitman was an anchor for 10 years at KCEN and was called into work early that day as the weather had already fired up on that late spring afternoon. I just remember that it was a strange day kind of from the start. I mean, I remember being at home in Temple, um, where our studio was in Bruceville, Eddie at the time, and it, you, it was just something different about the day. I just remember coming in and uh, not having time to do anything else. We just, I just got put on the set and Bruce was already, Bruce Thomas was already on the air. It looks like now. Reporter Marion Young's day started off differently than any other day of her life. The Gatesville native had a doctor's appointment that morning and was already scheduled to be in a little bit late. She had a special announcement for her mom before going to work. And took her some flowers and I said, congratulations, you're going to be a grandmother again. And I remember that vividly. That was how that day started. Um, kind of a surprise, you know, we had Josh was 10. We take a little break there, but uh, we were going to have another child. So I get to Temple. Um, like I said, I was working out of the Temple Bureau, and I think things started happening very quickly. And talk about not wanting to make the news. Marion and her cameraman had set up in Troy, and the just one month pregnant mother to be got a phone call from meteorologist Bruce Thomas, who was on the air. Troy, take cover immediately. Get out. But we took off down 35 and we found a safe place to stop. Um, Bruce is in the studio live, talking to me on the phone. And the plan was, like I said, we would get out in front of it. And we stopped and we got out and Bruce is in the studio talking to me on the phone and he's live. And this is, I remember this very vividly as does my family and friends. He goes, Marion, get back in the truck. He screams at me, get back in the truck. Y'all get out of there. I got goosebumps. Yeah. 
I remember that very vividly. And you're pregnant. Yeah. Like I said, it was just, yeah, it was just that day. So it's kind of started in Lorena and then made its way down. So yes, you know, there was a tornado in Bruceville Eddy, uh, which is where we were. So that was a, a moment to, that you think, well, you know, we've got to stay on the air. We're not going to take shelter. Um, so yeah, it, could, it got scary. Then after arriving home just after midnight, Marion was called out the next morning to go live for the morning show. You know, being from a small town, and Gerald was even smaller 25 years ago. Yes. And um, we knew that, you know, I think at the time we said at least 30, and I don't think it had been, ended up being that many, but we knew that homes had just been, like I said, decimated. There was nothing left, and we couldn't imagine. And it was just, it was hard. I yeah. Well, I mean, when there's 27 lives that are lost, it's definitely one of the um, biggest events that happened um, when I was here, and I was here for 10 years. Um, but yeah, there's definitely the, the Branch Davidians, Oklahoma City bombing, um, and then the Gerald Tornado, and then you go on to 9-11. Uh, but these are huge events, and um, it's definitely up there with, with those. And as the media continued to cover the extent of this deadly tornado, many people began to realize Gerald was just not the place they wanted to be. Our recent severe storms have made one woman decide to leave the tornado prone area after fears that another F5 would come and take her family. So of course all this had to be scraped and start from scratch. LaDonna Peterson shows us what her family's property used to look like, where she and others took shelter when an F5 tornado hit in 1997. And when they crawled out of shelter, the bathroom they were in was the only thing standing. I wanted to move then because I just, it was too much for me. But she and her family stayed and rebuilt what they could. Peterson lost many neighbors who lived along County Road 305 that day. Unless you were here and saw what we saw and went through what we went through, you would, you couldn't understand. And you couldn't understand how that affects you now. She says every time a storm blows in, it brings up a little bit of fright and the unknown. What are you gonna walk out and see this time? Um, and you worry about your family. It makes her wonder why she's still in Gerald. In March of this year, the town was hit by another tornado. This one followed almost the same path as a storm did 25 years ago. Peterson said once again, her family's property was damaged. It's very traumatic when those storms come through because even though you don't think it would be, when it actually is here. Fast forward two weeks, another tornadic storm would touch down in Salado, barely missing the Gerald community. We sat there and watched go by, and I was like, that's it. You know, I just, I can't handle it anymore. Now the Peterson property is on the market. It's sad to leave in a way because we call this home. They're choosing to leave and not take a chance on surviving another twister. Just massive destruction. You ever seen anything like it? No, sir. That's my first tornado. Hope it's my last. But Colette and Pam were in the house when it got hit. 25 years ago, in a house on this hill, Sherry Strothide's two sisters were running for cover. And they got into the bathtub, covered up with every blanket and pillow in the house. And then it hit. The tornado destroyed all but two rooms in the whole residence the bedroom right next to the bathroom that they were happened to be in and the bathroom they were in. Her sisters were lucky and they lived and her mother and father were in a different part of town. So the family was able to reunite a short time later. I jumped out of the truck my girlfriend was driving and ran to my mom. But it was just a matter of time before the true horror of the destruction started to set in. As families started the cleanup process, they found some of the souls who didn't make it. Everybody who helped clean up, I know for a fact, saw more than they needed to see. Um, I know I saw a couple things that I wish I never would have saw. And Strodehide and her family then started to hear of the other people they lost. Uh, my kids, they're, they're two best friends that they always played with when they came to visit my mom. They were killed. 
And then I found out that one of my good friends that I, I, I worked with was killed. And I found out through that, through the radio. And now, 25 years later, even living in another state, she still remembers the day whether she wants to or not. Long after the memorials have passed and the pictures have been tucked away, the sadness remains. Every year on that day, whether I think about it or not, somewhere in me, I know that day. Strothide says she still feels a weariness and a depression that may never go away. A reminder of the true wrath that nature can bring. The Gerald tornado showed us what can happen, whether it happens again or not around us. We are very aware of what they can do. Gerald was such a small town when this tornado struck back in 1997. Barely 400 people lived there, so everyone knew everyone. And even though the town has grown much since that day 25 years ago, the impact of this tragedy hasn't left their minds. When you go through an experience like that, it is such, it is so imprinted in your brain that it's just vivid and it stays vivid. I don't think any of the people that had those experiences will ever forget how they felt on that day. A town with rich history and good people. That's Gerald, Texas, through the eyes of Priscilla King. But others know the Central Texas town as a site of devastation. When you Google Gerald, what you get is the tornado, but that doesn't that doesn't define the town. King considers herself the town historian. She's even co-authored a book about Gerald, mainly to tell the story right. Eight, eight separate chapters and only one is about the tornado. 25 years ago, on May 27th, 1997, King was working at her child care facility. I remember where I was, what I was doing, what it looked like. And so, no, it doesn't seem like 25 years by a long shot. When the storm hit, people off I-35 started coming in to take shelter. That's what I saw. This is, this is exactly what I saw. And then, but the next one that I saw looked like this. Just on the other side of town, in plain sight, the massive tornado would take the lives of 27 people, 13 of them children. It still is emotional, it's still fearful, and I guess it, that'll never end. It took everything in its path, including many houses on County Road 305, where LaDonna Peterson lived. All of this was gone. There wasn't any of this left. The outbuildings were all gone. When Peterson crawled out of the bathroom where her family was taking shelter, the bathroom was the only thing left standing. The hardest thing when you go through something like that is when it's over and you turn around and you don't even have a toothbrush for your child or clean clothes or food and it's hard. Almost everything else just gone, but her family unharmed. You lose a lot of memories a lot of tangible things. But if you walk away with your family, that's the best thing you can get. Peterson says after the deadly tornado, the entire community became a family. It was amazing what they did. They opened up the schools, they made meals, they made places for people to sleep. It's a vision King chooses to hold on to every day commemoration of how far we've come and what good we've been able to do uh, for others since then. And that goodness continues to grow in Daryl even 25 years later. One of the families lost in this tragedy, the Igo family, will even have a new elementary school built in their honor, bearing their name. And for more stories of survival from that day and all of the hope that came out of the Daryl tornado, we invite you to log on to our website, kcentv.com. Thank you for joining us.